Hi everyone, I'm Phil Liggett and welcome to Liège in Belgium. And this morning all of Belgium is preparing for the 77th Classic liege Bastogne liege You know, this is the oldest World Cup Classic on the calendar. It's one of the oldest classics indeed that has ever been. And the race today is over 260 plus kilometres. It's a long way. It's the longest out and home course, I think, that there's left in the world of cycling. I can't think of a single name, apart from Sean Kelly, who's recovering from his crash in Paris and racing down in Spain today, who's missing from this list of riders. It is a most impressionable list. Gianni Bugno, the World Cup holder, is back in racing now after illness. And alongside him, men that we will expect to see in the Tour de France, like Pedro Delgado, Miguel Injuren, Marino Lajaleta, three top Spanish riders. Why are the climbers here? Because this race in Belgium is full of hills. There are ten climbs. And on the ten climbs, there are two new ones, one of them taking the riders over the highest point in Belgium. They say it really is very, very hard indeed. Coming towards the end of the race, there are two vicious little brutes called the Côte de la Redoute and the Côte des Forges. And the strong men who come to this point at the head of the pack can expect to lead out towards the finish down here in Liège. The riders themselves always want to do well in this classic because the man who wins it is usually one of the best riders in the world. Eddie Merckx, for example, has won this race on five previous occasions. That's why he's one of the great legends of world cycling. We can expect, too, another good performance from the Motorola team after Steve Bauer's fighting performance in Paris-Roubaix, where he finished fourth. Maybe he'll be up in the action, too, or maybe he'll have to give his place to Phil Anderson, the Australian, who has ridden well in this classic before. Other riders are here, too, like Greg LeMond of the United States, who's proved to the world he can win the Tour de France and the World Championship, but everybody still waits him to win a classic race. This race could be the one. 26 of the world's finest cyclists line up for the start of Liège Baston Liège. Among them, Stephen Roach, who's had a second and a third in this event, still awaits the win, and this year his form is good. Claude Cacillon, a professional who retires at the end of a 13-year career, has never won this race virtually in his own back garden. Claudio Chiapucci, this year winner of Milan San Remo, last year second in the Tour de France. On a cold and chilly day, although the sun is out at the moment, snow is forecast as the field rolls away. The race distance 267 kilometers, and we can now join the action out on the course. So the race story so far, Thierry Bourguignon from the Toshiba team broke clear this morning at Hufelitz with 62 kilometres of the race covered. So Thierry Bourguignon anticipating a long breakaway today, but he's been picked up now. We're 79 kilometres from the finish and we are in the town of Stavlo. And these graphics indicating the steepness of the next hill to come up. This is the Côte de haute Levé. Steepest gradient of 12%, coming right at the start of the climb, a very narrow approach indeed. Well, Bourguignon had a lead of seven minutes at one stage today, but he was picked up. His legs just cracked up in the end, the small group got to him first, but I must say that the main field, very tenacious today. They've also been racing through some quite heavy uh, sleet and some very cold rain. This is Benny Van Brabant here from the SEFP team. It's a local professional team, and Van Brabant riding very strongly here at the front. This is the climb of the Côte de haute Levée. 193 kilometres covered when they go over the top of this climb. It's still the best part of an hour and three quarters of racing to come. Van Brabant is trying to keep the pace up here, but the whole field has come up alongside him. And that on the far left looks like Claudie Coquillon, who's trying to move to the front. He's been playing an active role, but so far, all of the heads of state in this race have been wandering around the big bunch together. And they're quite content at this stage to let Van Brabant set the pace. No one in the lead now. Everybody has been swept up. There's been a few attacks since the capture of Thierry Bourguignon, among them Maurizio Fondriest, Derek de Wolf, and the champion of the Soviet Union, Dmitry Konishev. They've all been brought back. And Krakilion settling in now. After his great second place in Flesh Wallon the other day, the Belgians here 
have come out in force to hope that they will cheer home their national champion. This is the one race that Coquillion has tried but never won. I think his best chance, quite frankly, was when he was away with Stephen Roach uh, back in 1987. And that was the last year that Moreno Argentine won this race. And Stephen Roach and Claudio Coquillion spent so much time towards the end arguing with each other as to who was going to set the pace that Argentine came from absolutely nowhere and beat them both to the line. And look at this strong attack now on the haute leve by Coquillion. He's absolutely opening a gap here. This is exactly what the crowd were hoping to see. And Coquillion has faced some pressure this week. He's been at the headlines of every national paper here in Belgium. And they've all been saying that Claudie will not let us down. We rely on you, Claudie. They call him Crick the Lion. He turned professional back in 1979. And at that stage, I must say, he looked like a future winner of the Tour de France. And that's another thing. When he does retire this year, That'll be one of his sad memories, the fact he's never won a stage in the Tour, but look at this, Moreno Argentine has pedalled up alongside him and didn't he make it look easy? Argentine winning the Flesh Wallon for the second time earlier in the week. He's now searching for a fourth victory here in Liège, Baston Liège. World champion in the United States in Colorado Springs back in 1986, Argentine. And Coquillion looks across, doesn't seem too concerned, almost as if he expected to see the Italian alongside him. And now the Italian is continuing what Coquillion has started here as we head up towards the top of the haute levee. The Ardennes. And on the back of the field here, Eric van Lanker, last year's winner, has done a good ride to join this league group, which was started by Claudio Coquillon and Moreno Argentin. And this group has now developed into quite a breakaway. Ten riders here, here's a list of them. Apart from van Lanker, you've got Raul Alcala, there he is. And Johan Brunil from the Lotto team, who's settling in now. We're expecting a lot from him this season, especially in the Tour de France. Inaki Gaston. From the class team from Spain, Miguel Indurain. He's been sick, but he's put this race down as one of the races he wants to do well in this year. Well, he's made a good start now, hasn't he? And Marino Lacheretta, Spanish leader of the Once team. There's the rider who started it all, champion of Belgium, Claudie Coquillon. And this now is the big selection, I think, in this year's Liège, Baston Liège. There is a group chasing behind, which includes Phil Anderson and Charlie Motte and they're running at around 45 seconds to a minute back. Oh, well, there we are, there's confirmation. One minute and five seconds to the Anderson group. Setting the pace at the front now, Rolf Sorensen, the leader in the World Cup competition. This is round uh, number four this year in the competition. Sorensen actually finished Paris-Roubaix last week, which was something he was aiming to do. He was outside the World Cup points, but it was his fourth attempt at that race, and he hadn't finished the previous three rides. 54 kilometres to go from the finish. We're entering Stumont here. And this breakaway has come together after the climb of the haute Levé. And the climbers beginning to enjoy themselves. La Jaleta, Alcala, there's Sorensen taking a break at the back. What a great start to the season that man is having. A Danish rider having finished second in Milan San Remo, third in the Tour de Flanders, and then didn't score in Paris Bay last week, but now he's in the big breakaway here in the age Bass on the age. Little caps at the bottom there indicating there are still four of the ten climbs to come. There's Inaki Gaston dropping back a little bit, but all of these riders still content to work together. From what I can see, none of them are acting as a passenger here. They're all going through, doing their work at the front, swapping around the pace. And news that Konishev, the champion of the Soviet Union, is still trying to catch up with this league group. Well, it won't be too long now before we head down to the next climb on the itinerary, which will be the Côte de Lorsa. Roach wearing number 51, perhaps the most famous number in professional cycling. It's the number that's been worn 
by more winners of the Tour de France than any other number. And Marino Lajareta thinking of a good crack at the Tour of Spain this year when he hopes once more to go for the big triple, the Tour of Spain, the Tour of Italy and the Tour de France. Rides for the Spanish Once team, which by the way is a national institution for the blind in Spain. And it's the seventh biggest corporation in that, com in that country. And by the way, uh, this, the Massa, too, on the Once team, is also blind. Johan Brunil, the rider who rode so well in the Tour de France last year, and he's developing, despite his size, into a very, very good mountain climber. Just five kilometres to go now before we start the climb of the Lorsa. And that will take us up to around 225 kilometres once we top over. And this is Inaki Gaston here taking his shoe covers off, so the pace is certainly hotting up. It hasn't been a great day for weather, by the way, so far. The riders, in fact, have passed through, especially down by Bastogne. They've passed through some quite heavy snow flurries. And it's been very, very cold indeed. Well, we have to say we're sorry for the microwave breakup, but again, it's due to the links to the helicopter from the motorbikes, but I'm sure you'll agree the action is worth it. They crossed over the Côte de Hossier, but although it was said to be the toughest climb in Belgium, there was no action on it at all because Thierry Bourguignon had control there, leading by the best part of seven minutes. He's back in the field now. It seems as though the field had a great deal of respect for one another today. Heading on to the Lawson now. And there is the full group that we're looking down upon. The main bunch, or what's left of the main bunch, is racing at around one minute back. Early spring in the Ardennes. The weather down in this section of Belgium is always beautiful, but you know the weather changes so quickly here in the hills. Cloud formation always affected by the dense forest areas. It is so different from the Flanders section of Belgium. And still that breakaway at 65 seconds. So although our cameras aren't dropping back to show you this chase at the moment, quite clearly it is a good one because they're not slowing down at all in the chase and, and I must say that you've got to look to this group at the front too who don't seem to be panicking either they're just keeping on the pressure they know that this race will finally be decided in the last few climbs to come now heading up towards the village of Tognon 51 kilometers covered uh, to go rather and isn't it funny in big races how the previous year's winner always seems to put in a very special effort and that's what Van Lanker's had to do here today is on the far side of our picture there Riding behind Stephen Roach. Eric Van Lanker carrying the colours today of Panasonic. They had a great start to the season last year with Eddie Plankett winning the Milan San Rio, winning the Paris Bay rather, in that millimetre finish from Steve Bauer. And then Van Lanker going on to win this race one year ago. And now he's in what appears to me to be the decision again. There's Johan Brunil, turned professional back in 1987, didn't win a race then. Since then, he's had 12 victories as a professional. And last year, finished 17th in the Tour de France. Well, Claude Capillon has made no secret about his desires to win this race, so he set himself up, really, as the man to knock down. While Paris-Roubaix was on television last week, Claude Capillon was out for five hours on his bike training up by his home. He came back in, he watched the finish of Paris-Roubaix on television, and then he went back out behind the motorbike to continue his training. His preparation has been excellent for these two classics here in Belgium, at what they used to call, in fact, the Ardennes weekend, because they used to be on Saturday and Sunday, Flesh Wallon and the Age Bastogne the Age. Now they split them apart. It's a great shame that the Flesh Wallon is not part of the World Cup series. It's suffering from the fact it's in Belgium and it's too close to this classic race. But it is equally a noted race and quick who's won that one before, finished second in it the other day, and now he's hoping to go one better here.
everybody continuing to work well together. The climb still to come, the Côte de la Redoute. And we can look at the map here, you see the flashing going on at the top of our picture. That's where we are at the moment, at the Lorsa. And now leaving the heart of the Ardennes around Trois-Ponts. It's a magnificent area. If anybody wants to come over here and go just cycle touring, it's beautiful. This is the climb here, 12% gradient, you see, an average of 5.6%. Take, takes them up to a height of 415 metres. Van Lanka keeping his knees warm, I note, from the cold weather today. No sign of any passengers at all in this group. Lotto have the strength, with two riders here like Ariostia. That might prove decisive as this race comes to an end. They've got the opportunity to counter-attack. Miguel Indurain, who start the season hampered a little bit by illness. And Stephen Rose looking good. And the same two could be said of Eric Van Lanka and Raul Alcala. The PDM team has not had a great deal of success at all this year yet. And it's strange, but I feel they're missing Sean Kelly out since Paris Nice because of that broken collarbone. The second year in succession where he's broken his collarbone very early on. Last year it was in the Tour of Flanders. A silly fall on a sharp corner. And this year it was a crash in Paris Nice. Now let's have a little bit look uh, look further down. This is the chase group here. Not surprisingly, it's the RMO riders are having to do a lot of the work. This is Eric Caritu, former champion. And um, we've got the Brazilian rider here too, trying to do a little bit of work. Morro Ribeiro on the RMO team. And this is Dufo, a new professional from Switzerland. Well, they're still in with a chance, but they're going to have to close this down very, very quickly. This is the group, in fact, which Phil Anderson is in, but I can't see Phil at a glance here. There's still quite a few powerful riders up in this group. Michel Dernis, I can see, back down in the centre there for the Wyman colours. But the RMO are the big losers at the minute. They haven't got a man in that breakaway, and it's all down to them to chase it down. Some help from Helvetia La Suisse, because they're in the same boat. The La Suisse team not quite as strong as RMO. And that there are a lot of teammates on the front too who want to keep this race nice and steady. Edwin van Hoydon to the right, he's missed the break as well. And number 44 pedaling along here is Rolf Goltz. Well, he's happy to keep it at this pace because his two men are right up there. Too many wanted. There's the gap. It's one minute to the group we're looking at at the moment. One minute 35 back to the rest of the field. Time running out as we head down out of the valleys. We'll be on our way towards Remouchon very shortly. Very nice cafe on the corner there. If you ever fancy a cup of tea when you're pedalling around the Ardennes, I don't suppose the riders will be stopping up. And a short stretch of cobblestones, which will take them up onto the climb of La Redoute. Of Goltz, also a man that seems to be refining his form. Change of teams for him. With the Buckler team last year. Got off to a good start with them too when he finished second in Milan San Remo, but uh, things have changed after that. He didn't really do well all season. And he, he fell out with team manager Jan Ross, who left him out of the Tour de France. Now Rolf has joined the Italian team. Ari Ostia, there he is. And little Charlie Motte trying to keep in touch. Edwig van Hoydonk wearing the same lucky long trousers which won him the Tour de Flanders the other week, although they weren't quite so lucky in Paris Roubaix, but he rode well there too. And there's Anderson. So Phil Anderson hoping that this group will bring back that leading group, but there are so many star riders up there, you know. Stephen Hodge riding on the far side, the Australian. That is uh, really a big mistake by this group. The strong men went clear using their strength. There's Maurizio Fondriest. He was extremely active early on. In fact, he countered the original breakaway by Thierry Bourguignon, and he brought Bourguignon to heel, but then fell back to the group and might well have been recovering, in fact, when Claudio Cacillon started applying the pressure. Claudio Chiapucci, too. 
Finding his ears a bit cold by the look of it. Kia Pucci now, people were saying he was a lucky man last year in the Tour de France and uh, wasn't an absolute worthy of that second place. But I feel he was. He rode an excellent race. He proved he wasn't going to give up that yellow jersey easily. Greg LeMond really had to race him for it towards the end, although in the end it became something of a formality. But this year, the win in Milan San Remo, well, that's confirmed him now as a top cyclist. He also won, by the way, his first ever stage race this year. It sounds strange, doesn't it, when you've just finished second in the Tour de France? He's never actually won a stage race until this season. So his season going well, and they're slowly pulling them back to 38 seconds now. A lot of work are being done here. This is Yvonne Madio, brother of Mark, who last week won Paris Roubaix. Sweeping along the road. Let's see what's going on a bit further down. Let's see where the leaders are. Still a lot of daylight between the two bunches. The oldest classic, and the roads are a lot nicer than they must have been in 1894 when Leon Hua was the winner from Belgium. That race then was 223 kilometers long, but we've come on a bit further since then now. This one is 267. And the shouts there for Alcala, they spotted him in the breakaway. Naki Gaston, former teammate of Sean Kelly. And the grand old man is hers as grey as mine is. Marino Lagiretta. He rides a bike a bit better. Runeil and Indurain. What a lovely style Miguel Indurain has. Remember him on the mountains in the Pyrenees last year when he took on Greg LeMond for that finish at Luzardi Den and he sprinted away to the stage victory. Always rides well in the Pyrenees, Indurain. Head to head, Italy and Belgium, and the two riders who fought out flesh were on. Walker Killion, nearest the camera, Moreno Argentin. Argentin, by the way, spent his winter in South Africa. And he gave uh, the mechanic in the bicycle shop quite a, sh quite a shock in Cape Town when he rolled in with a pair of wheels and said, would he true them? And he said, um, but excuse me, aren't you Moreno Argentin? He says, yes, I'm on holiday with my wife. And when the mechanic, uh, told the story to the cyclists who came in the next day, nobody would believe him that Argentine was actually there. They found him though, and they went training with him. But I must say that the professional riders have been saying all this spring that it's only a matter of time before Argentine wins a big race. He's absolutely flying, they keep saying, and he's proved that to us already because he won flesh well on so easily on that breakaway, lasting some 70 kilometers. Well, we're almost at the top of the Lawson. Back here with the Van Poyedonk group now, which is still making progress. There's Derek De Wolf, warning of somebody on the inside, and the pace being set all of the time here by Ivan Madio, trying desperately to get Charlie Motte back into the action. Galt's not doing anything to help, he's just sitting there, antagonizing as best he can hoping that nobody else wants to take up the pace. What a lonely race Liège Baston Liège is. Nobody ever gets the chance to say a few words to one another. You're no sooner over one of these hills. It's coming down, 29 seconds and 1.30 back to the main field. You're no sooner over one hill, you have a short descent and you're on to the next one. The only consolation is one or two of the real steep ones over the years have been taken out because they're on roads too narrow now for modern day cycling. Because not only do you have to think of the increased field size, 200 starters allowed in races of this quality these days, but there's also the following cars who demand the right to get to their riders and it's absolutely impossible on some of the roads of yesteryear. Firstly, Age Bast on the Age, by the way, didn't start in the Age at all. It started in Spa, where the flesh will on starts from these days. It was Spa Bast on your Spa. As it seems to have found now a permanent home at the Age, it's been to the Age Bast on Verbier as well in the past. A bit of tree felling going on here. So we're going back up to this lead group. 
And there's a counter-attack coming from the field. They're feeling that they might well be in touch with the leaders now. Goltz is still hanging on in there in third place, but it's Charlie Motte who's got to the front and wants to try and finish this off and contact the leaders. Dirk de Wolf sitting behind him, then Rolf Goltz. And that's Sammy Morels in fourth place, the other lotto rider. Sammy Morels had a couple of wins this year already. And a lot happier start to the season than last year. There he is. He was riding in the Tour of the Americas last year, crashed badly and broke his leg, and that delayed his continuance of the season. Van Hoyerdonk is here as well, anxious to also try and bridge this gap. Buckler could do with a man up front. At least the pressure's off a little bit because Jan Ross was demanding a classic win for the team this year, and he finally got it with the Tour de Flanders win by Van Hoyerdonk. And there's the Buckler team bus there. Richard Van Hoyerdonk would like to be inside with the heater on right now, too. 24 seconds, it's coming closer. Stephen Hodge. Another Australian who settled into the big time. It's only a matter of time now before Stephen Hodge gets a real big victory. He's a very talented rider. And number 18 sitting in the back here is Gerard Rouet, just off our camera at the moment. New team for Gerard this year from coming over from the French teams, joining Elvisha La Suisse alongside Paul Cockley. And number 105 here is Laurent Jalabert. We just missed him, but Laurent Jalabert, there he is. He is also, well, everybody seems to agree, he is the best of the new crop of French riders. He can sprint and he can stay. In other words, he can attack on the flat. Let's go back up and have a look at the leading group. Still working away. It's looking a bit as though they might get picked up now, though. Van Lanker is doing a fair share of the work. Coquillion is never far away from the front. Raoul Alcala going through. La Charetta. And Rolf Sorensen. This is the break that the Ariostia boys wanted. They've got both of their riders in it. Lotto have got two riders in, so there's two big teams. They will not be doing anything behind in that chase group. And it's a breakaway that came away by the use of sheer force, because once Krakilion had attacked, it was only those who spotted it could grit the teeth and get across quickly have made it so far. Because it gained a minute very rapidly indeed. They haven't panicked, but having said that, now we've got a split forming here. We're heading down towards Remuchon. And there's a little split formed. Ladjuretta having to accelerate to get on the back of the line. Brunil slipping it up a gear now as the pace goes up to over 60 kilometers an hour. And our motorcyclist choosing the wrong line here. The rider's coming right over on him. So we may not get to know. And the gap is opening a little bit, Lug. 35 seconds now. So they've allowed it to come almost up to them. And somebody has started an attack at the front. Much of the way, this course is really a figure of eight, dropping right down to Hufelitz, where he goes round in the circle and back into Hufelitz, and then it goes off to Stavlo and Francochon, and then comes over the Lorsa, where we've just seen. We're now heading back up, more or less in a straight direction to Liège. And that breakaway is not as happy as it was. There's a lot of riders now trying to get clear, are anxious to break it up, may have felt it was just a little bit too big. 37 kilometers to go, They're located at Arze. But what it has managed to do, we to put that attack in, it's knocked up about 10 seconds in the game, and that might well serve to demoralize the chase behind. Three climbs still to come, so the next one will definitely be the Côte de la Redoute, then we'll go on to the Côte d'Ornay, and finally the Côte des Forges. And then it's all downhill to the edge. And this group is still not getting clear of that chase group, although the chase group behind is thinning out a little bit. Phil Anderson is still there. And there is the information, the next climb to come, the climb of Laradoute. It starts, in fact, as we, we just snick into the edge of the town of Remouchon. It's a lovely little town. It nestles in the mountains, has an enormous 
viaduct that crosses it carrying the main auto route into the Ardennes and out to the Age. The town itself still largely untouched. Miguel Indurain there, turned professional back in 1985 after he won the Amateur National Championship of Spain years before that. And let's have a look back at the group. There's Charlie Motte. And he must be beginning, be beginning now to be feeling a little bit frustrated because they're not getting any closer. We're back into Remachon here. And that, to me, looks like Sorensen has gone clear of the league group. It's a white jersey. It uh, must be the one worn by the World Cup leader, Rolf Sorensen. So Sorensen has decided he wants to get a good look at Laradoup before anybody else because there's Indurain looking across and wants some help. There's a reaction coming from the breakaway. Well, this is a perfect tactic now because he's giving Moreno Argentin the chance to follow behind and the others are bound to chase him. And that is going to soften them up for the climb of Laradoup. It's a brute of a climb. There's a massive crowd on there, by the way. They say that the motor car is actually stopping on the auto route to look across, which obviously is a dangerous practice, but it's not uncommon in Belgium when there's a big classic race going close by. And there's Sorensen, he's sat up, and he's watching who did all the work to get him, and it was Claude Quillon who caught him up. He's certainly feeling frisky this season, Ross Sorensen. General regroupment then of the main field here. Well, the leading group anyway. So Rolf's father Jens waiting at the finishing line. He rode in the Olympic Games in 1960, by the way, uh, Jens. And as I say, he's on crutches at the finish, waiting to see the arrival of his son. There he is. And Sorensen's ambition, and always been his ambition, is to be the world's number one rider. Well, this year, he's certainly taken a giant stride forward, and there was a hint of it coming last year, too, because he won Parry Tours last year and the Sicilian Week. These counter-attacks are taking effect. 35 kilometres to go, Iwai, which is the big town, before we race along the valley, just a couple of kilometres then to Remouchon, and then we're on to Laradout. It won't hold any fears for men like Eric Van Lanker there and Marine Lacheretta. They are climbers. Virtually every rider who has ambition in this race today has been out on the course this week, checking out the roads. The two new climbs didn't make a great deal of difference to the race because everybody's afraid of the end of this stage, and that is uh, the last couple of mountains towards the finish. And so the, the two new climbs, quite frankly, are just a little bit too far away for them to concern themselves with them. Just settling in, keeping the tempo going. After that little flurry of activity there. Sorensen seems to have controlled himself now. He's sitting in the group. And there's Anaki Gaston. The Spanish riders are doing well in this breakaway, aren't they? That's where we are, and that's where we're going up towards the A's. Redoute, Ornay, Forge. Three climbs left still to come. We're now on our way out of Hawaii, and we're on that road which takes us now down to Remouchon. And the breakaway group has fallen back a little bit. 55 seconds is what it is. So they're just about into the town centre of Hawaii at the moment. We'll be making a left turn very shortly and bouncing over a stretch of cobblestones. Yesterday, which was a Saturday, there was a local town race here in Remouchon. And the start and finish line was on the cobblestones. Well, at least this, the riders here are only going to have to ride across them before they go around the back streets and climb Laradout. It's a very narrow approach to Laradoute, but there's no other way to get onto it. And so that's the way you've got to go. Coquillion knows these roads so well. He's one of the few Walloons to become a top cyclist. He's lived and trained in the area for most of his life. Although he lives now over by 
the wall of Gerard's burden. Sorry about a little bit of picture breakup. It's all to do with our technical link up to the helicopters and the motorbikes, which then put the signals down on the finishing line. So we can all see the pictures and occasionally buildings or bridges, and in that case it was that bridge over the road, uh, breaks the link for us. Well, to look at these riders' faces, they all seem to be quite happy. They're certainly giving nothing away. Claudie Coquillion there, riding this race for the last time. He must feel quite sad about that, but he has been a great cyclist. He's also a very nice person to know. He's a good friend of Sean Kelly's. There was a rumor once that they would ride on the same team, but it's never worked out. And he never seems to have a shave the day he rides. Some of the riders are superstitious about that. He always has this sort of gray shadow. Makes him look more aggressive. That must be it. But he had a lovely season last year, Claude Coquillion. Riding one of his best tours to France. For some years, anyway. Winning the national championship of Belgium, finishing ninth in the tour. And this year, he's made absolutely certain he's got the form to go out on a high note. Stephen Roach deciding it's time to take off the old arm warmers. Well, Roach was out here on the course on Friday with his teammate, Laurent Pion. They both went over Laradou together. Laurent Pion, new professional, which Stephen has taken with him on the Belgian Tonton Tapis team this year. There's the World Cup situation as we come to this race. Rolf Sommerson with 42 points. Mark Madio, especially after his victory in Paris Bay last week, in second place. Edwin van Hooydonk, he won the Tour of Flanders, his third. Carlo Bowmans of Belgium, riding very, very well this year in fourth place. And Franco Ballerini is up into fifth place. That's the World Cup standings. The first 20 riders on the stage today will receive points towards that World Cup situation. And Sorensen is doing himself the world of good right now because he's in this winning breakaway. Well, <laughs> if it is a winning breakaway, he's certainly in the leading breakaway anyway. And it looks to me as though Sorensen is going again at the front here, or is that still Roach out front? But whoever it is has gone clear. As we come into Remouchon. But if the riders turn right instead of left, they'll go back to a town they passed through a couple of hours ago called Trois-Ponts. Well, I guess they'll go left this time and head back now towards Liège via the, probably the most feared climb of it of them all, the Laredoute. And this, in fact, is Rolf Sorensen who's gone clear here. This is the second time that Rolf has attacked as we will now head down towards the left turn and a short stretch of cobblestones to take us up towards the climb. Sorensen clearly deciding that it's his job now to soften this breakaway up in favour of Moreno Argentini's team leader. This is the stretch of roads that will take us down to the cobbles. In fact, we're on them already. Oh, two parked cars, surprisingly, been allowed to stay on the route of Liège Baston Liège today. It's not uh, usual to see that. But a nice little crowd here. This is a very nice holiday village in the height of summer. At this time of the year, everybody comes to witness the passing of Liège, Baston Liège, the gateway now to the last three climbs and always the most crucial. Sorensen here has a lead of about 15 seconds. There is the brute, 20% its maximum gradient. And it takes you up to only 292 meters, but what a way to go with an elevation of 161 meters. And Sorensen wants to see it first. He's not the world's best climber. In Milan San Remo, he was in the lead with Claudio Chiapucci this year, and he found the Poggio climb was one too many, which comes just before the end. He was dropped by Claudio Chiapucci, who went on to win at the bottom of the hill. So Sorensen doing the next best thing today. That's getting out in front. If he does lose ground, at least he'll be still with the leaders when, he, when they go over the top. That's the theory. Now, as you go under the auto route here, 
you make a sharp right and that's where the climb really starts. And there's the cars we'd heard about and they certainly have stopped on the auto route to look down at the race. And there's the right turn for Sorensen when he comes under the bridge. It's quite a good lead he's got too, isn't it, over that chase group. It's a good start to the climb for him. So that leaves nine riders in that chase group. Sorensen here, now on the steep section of the climb. And the crowd, we understand, enormous on the climb. Check on progress by Rolf, 21 seconds. A very, very good lead at this point. Gradient not too bad here, but it won't ease up now for a couple of kilometers. In fact, it'll get steeper very shortly as he gets around the corner. This is back with the chase group. Inaki Gaston sitting at the back along with last year's winner, Eric Van Lanker. Johan Brunil, Lachretta in the yellow, Raul Alcala. And there is Argentin and Cordy Caquillon. They're both near the front and setting the rhythm along with Stephen Roach. Far side, Miguel Indurain. What a select group this is. Some of the world's great names, some of the riders we hope to see in action right at the front in this year's Tour de France. One name missing, of course, that of Greg LeMond. He really does seem to struggle to find the early season form that might uh, finally win him the classic, which he's never done. Until he does, of course, you can never compare his performances with that of Eddie Merckx. Well, this climb is so narrow that there's no cars allowed to be brought up it by the public. So these people here have had to walk right down from the village where we saw Sorensen coming over those cobblestones. It's a fair old walk. some idea too of the hike now because way in the distance you can see the uh, viaduct I was telling you about which runs over the back of Remouchon and that group riding very very compactly indeed and there's the crowd Sorensen now getting up towards the top of the climb it levels out a little bit he's on the steep section there but it levels out a little bit then kicks again before he'll finally go under the finish banner at the top of the climb <laughs> That's the finish of the climb, by the way, not the race. And there's the indication on the right of our screen, a 20% gradient, or if you're English like I am, uh, that makes it a climb of one in five. And this is Argentin and Coquillion now. It's interesting to see that Argentin himself is setting the pace in pursuit of his own teammate. Now, I suspect this was the plan for Sorensen to go away and Argentin to use his strength to counter the move. And it looks as though Coquillion is going with him. And this is a superb piece of riding by Claude Coquillion because this is the one climb where you've got to start reducing the size of this breakaway. Coquillion is not the world's greatest sprint finisher and he'll want to shed quite a few of these riders if he can. And this is a powerful piece of riding by Claude Coquillion. Sorensen still clear by about 20 seconds. Coquillion towing along now, the one man he doesn't want, of course, Moreno Argentin. And this is going to put both Ariostia riders up front and along with Claudio Coquillion, somebody else is trying to get across the gap there as well. Champion of Belgium really rising to the occasion today. He's saying his farewell to the Ardennes in the best possible manner. And this is further up. This is Rolf Sorensen in the lead. Still wondering why they haven't caught him yet. He's just kept the tempo going. Indurain has joined the other two. So this has split the breakaway now. Completely, in fact. Four of the riders have gone forward. We've got three of them here. Sorensen is up ahead. This is the end of the steep part of the climb. We just should we go round this bend and then there's a chance to settle in a little bit. Snip it up to a little higher gear. There we are. Confirmation of the group chasing. Coquillion, Argentine and Durain. And a look down the climb. There are the four chasers. So there are two riders, there they are too. There's two riders dropped off from the back of the remaining six. Stephen Roach is in that chase group, so too is Eric Van Lanker, I saw. And the crowd appreciating the good, honest effort here by the three leaders. Just ahead there, you can see Rolf Sorensen. 
so they're going to catch him exactly where I would have thought he would have planned to have been caught, right on the top of the climb with the effort over. A chance to recover because we're off to a sharp right turn down some narrow roads, very narrow roads in fact, and a short descent before we climb the Côte d'Ornay. Plenty of time to get a few deep breaths in. It's interesting to see now that these four riders have got clear. Stephen Roach will be kicking himself at missing this. There is Sorensen, and they're coming right up alongside him. He won't be too unhappy. I don't think Rolf attacked at that point to think of winning the race. I think he attacked because he wanted to make sure he could climb over the top of the ladder dudes, at least with the leaders, and that's exactly what's happened. Look, he's under the top of the Bandelay banner there, which is at the top of the hill. He's now rejoined by three more of the breakaway. Injurain is the first to him, followed by Cordy, and then Noveno. And there we are, the flags of the nations, Denmark, Italy, Belgium, and Spain. down the road and see what's happened. They've opened a reasonable gap, but it's not over yet by any manner of means. That's about 10, 12 seconds. I wouldn't think it's much more than that. Well, I can see Stephen Roach and I can see Eric Van Lanker down there. Oh dear me, the motorbike rather spoiling the chase here. and He's getting far too close. It's always a problem. And this is the narrow stretch of road I was telling you about, just 27 kilometres now to go at Rouvre, is where we are. Really, there's no such place to have note, there's just these couple of farmsteads, and then we're out again, back in the country, which is where the leaders are at the moment. And they're straight back into the stride here, and Sonson is looking very, very strong today. This has been one of his finest rides, and he's pulled off one or two in the last uh, 12 months of racing. Argentine, two climbs still to come, luck, and uh, two super climbs. Well, the Côte d'Ornay is not a great climb. It's a main road climb, but time is running out for Coquillion. He really will need to be away before the finish, I feel. Otherwise, the advantage is bound to swing across to Argentine, or even Sorensen if he gets his chance. And let's not forget Indurain. I think he'll have to attack too. It was his teammate last year who attacked on the Cote de Forge, Pedro Delgado. He got away too, but they brought him back before the finish. There's Rolf. as a pro when he was only 20 years of age, Rolf Sorensen, finished ninth in Milan-San Remo in 1986, but he never won a race at all that year. Stephen Roach, Marina Lagiretta here, so this is the chase group now, Lagiretta, Roach, uh, Van Lanker. And look, they're nearly on. They're very, very close indeed now. And Roach is driving the train here. There could be a regroupment here of at least four of them. Alcala is the other one. And so that means that Brunil and the Naki Gaston have been shed on the climb of Laradut and, as far as we know, are out of the hunt now. sharp right hand bend this one well they made it and then they'll run out onto the main road and for a moment or two they'll have a good road with a strong descent down to the start of the climb of the Côte de so Alcala showing us he's got some good form, so too Stephen Rhodes, Van Lanker putting up a determined defence of his championship, which he won in the A's last year. We're back up with the leaders now, and they seem very cool indeed. This is Argentine taking the last bite of the day and washing it down with a drink before the finish. 25 kilometres to go. Claudie Coquillion now set to leave the Ardennes on a high note. Well, 
this has been a very, very good race, the A's bashed on the A's. You can't fool the hills and you've got to have the strength if you want to take part at the front of the race. There's the chase group and there's the official gap of 15 seconds. So close, they're obviously both riding in two groups of four at virtually the same speed. Roach is doing a lot of work down there, so too is Van Lanker. And if only they could just close that gap. Spremont is where we are. 24 kilometers from the finish. Again, in Duane here, it's in the back. Now, look at what he'll try in Duane. He's been the quiet man of this break. He's the last one to get across to it. He also is not a fine finisher, so we will need to break clear, and time is running out. It looks like the last assault will have to come on the Cote de Forge. Stan Ocker will be watching over them in what is a magnificent memorial to the great Belgian cyclist of the 50s. And a 1.3 kilometers before the next climb. Duane was supposedly to be the man of the early season until he took ill. Pedro Delgado, team leader, wanting a quiet start to the season. Hopefully so he can have a more serious crack at the Tour de France. Of course, he always upsets the Spanish people when he doesn't ride his native Tour of Spain, which he's not going to do this year. There's the next climb, takes it up to 280 metres. It's a main road climb, we're on it now. Very, very wide road. And it is perfectly straight, so you can always see the top. And look at this, Coquillion setting the pace and keeping that rhythm going. He's been a marvellous mountain climber over the years. When he came to the Tour de France, for a while he was rivalling the other climber from the Belgian countryside, Lucien Van Impe, six times winner of the King of the Mountains in the Tour de France. looking down, he must have seen that chase coming up surely on this long straight climb. But they're just keeping the tempo going, the attitude seems to be, the others can catch us if they can. And Crick is going, Crick is going to launch an attack. He's gone late on the climb, but Sorensen and Argentin are both straight on to him. Well, Crick has kicked hard there, but Argentin has come rather arrogantly up alongside him again. His face hasn't even altered in expression. Now, that's the sort of thing that Eddie Merckx would have done, I have to say. He would have just come up on his rivals like that and said, are you serious? And that's the way Argentin has countered that move, and Crick keeping the rhythm on, but he has been countered by Argentin and the other two. Sorensen was watching very alertly as well, because he went almost at the same time as Crick did. And so they resume the rhythm of working it out together once more. Sorensen following now the wheel of his team captain. Sooner or later, they're going to have to make a decision here to see which one might be thinking of the victory because there isn't much time left. I think uh, Miguel Indurain will be feeling very pleased with his performance today too. This is back in the chase group. Raul Alcala doesn't seem to have done too much work in this group since he came across. Because each time we rejoin the group, Raul is sitting at the back there. So too La Jaleta. These two at the front seem to be doing most of the work. Lanka and Stephen. It's 13 seconds. It's been an awful lot of work just to nip off two seconds, hasn't it? La Jaleta going through now also. It's still possible because they're over the top of the Orne. We have a little bit of a drop then we swing right in a steady little drag, and then we'll start the last climb, which is the Cote de Forge. It is not a nice climb. It is not a main road climb, by the way. But the nice thing is the riders know it's the last one of the ten. It's 
2.1 kilometers long, by the way, and it takes us up to the 253 kilometers point, which will mean once at the top, 14 kilometers remain, and there's the gap. You can see them, but they can't reach them. Well, it's been a long time since we've seen a good hare and hounds pursuit like this. 3.3 kilometers to the forge. And still, Coquillion will not give up here. He's trying desperately now, and he must be having to think exactly how he's going to outmaneuver this lot. 15 seconds, they've lost the two seconds they gained. One minute 38 back to the Motte Anderson group. So they're out of it now, I'm afraid. They, that's been a good chase too, because they've never conceded to this breakaway at all. The pressure's quite clearly stayed on. I don't know how many's left back in that group, but I would think that there must be a lot of riders now shed out of it. There's the sharp right-hand turn. This will take the riders on Little Link Road across to the parallel main road, which will carry the race up the Cote des Forges. The Cote des Forges, by the way, is a very early climb in the Flesh Wallon. It comes after just a few kilometres, and therefore it doesn't really feature in that race at all. But in this race, it's the very last climb, and it always features. Stephen Roche determined to try and finish this off. He's doing a lot of work in this breakaway. 19 kilometers to go to the finish now. Dolombreu is the town we're passing through, or the housing area at least. There's Van Lanker, who seems willing to. And La Galette is working much better now as well. These the four leaders. Each one of them are willing keep up the pace. There's nobody actually shirking his duty here in this breakaway. It's quite clearly the four strong men have established at the front. It's a question of whether they can hold off that determined effort from Roach and Co. Seventh time that the age Baston Liège has been held, and the weather at least is staying quite kind towards the finish for us. 16 seconds. It looks as though we may have now witnessed the cracking of that Roach group. They came very close, so close they must have felt they could reach out because 13 seconds on a climb like Ornay was not far at all. But now it's dropped back to 16 seconds, and they're on the flat roads. They're also out of sight here for a while and that makes it even harder. The Cote des Forges will give us all of the answers because if this group is still clear by 15 seconds at the top of the forge, then I'm sure it will fight out the finish. Moreno Argentin has all too often showed us the great sprint finish he has. He knows if these four come down together, he must be swinging in his favour. He's the hot favourite. That's where we are now, heading up towards the final climb of this year's Liège Baston Liège. Climb number 10. And the PDM team manager, Jan Gispers, up alongside Raoul Alcala. And I wonder if he said to Raoul, look, just make a big effort and get across to that gap. You have nothing to lose. There's been no shortage of firepower there from Stephen Roach. And you saw that gap open. Raoul just let Roach go in. And now Walter Plankert having a word too with Eric van Lanker. We're on the forge now for the leaders. And there's a lovely crowd here enjoying the climb. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll see the actual monument of Stan Offers because of the crowd. Takes us up to a height of 301 metres. A big crowd here. They've all come out to see the kill, I suspect. But it's a pity that we won't see the memorial to Stan Ockers because of the crowd, but they're over, the memorial is over on the far right by the finishing line. But this is the last chance now for Coquillion. He's setting the pace to 
but he must know that setting the pace is going to be all that uh, Argentine wants. He'll sit around there behind him. In fact, he's riding alongside him as if to discourage any thought of attack. Injurain also riding close too. And the weak link appearing to be Sorensen, but having no problems sitting there at the back of the four. Injurain pedaling a visibly lower gear than the other two. sharp bends here as they start the climb up towards the summit now it's about a kilometer from the top here so no sign of an attack coming so it looks as though Gillian has felt obliged to allow this race to come down to a sprint finish his big attack coming on the Colt de la Lava Dute and fail there now there is the chase group it's a long way back now actually because this is quite a steady drag and I would say around 18 seconds that gap. Four of them still together and Indurain dictating the pace now. Songs are looking good once more. This has been one of Ralph's best rides I would say. Well, Rolf, Rolf Sorensen's best ride I've seen. He is uh, He's riding with such great confidence after that wonderful finish to the season last year. And just look at this too, he's even causing a little bit of pain up here. So Sorensen stretching and Kukilion marks him very, very quickly indeed. Taps out the rhythm alongside him. And the face on Argentine really looks as though he could play a game of poker. And another big crowd. Well, it wasn't possible for this crowd to transfer from Lado Dute. That so often happens in Paris Bay, where the crowds see the race go by and race across little tracks to find another section where the race is. But you can't do that so easily here at this stage of the race. So this is this has been an excellent day for the public watching the race. It's a tremendous atmosphere in Belgium. Cycle racing as popular as ever. Although the crowd always bemoaning the fact that they can't find a replacement for Eddie Merckx. It was a period of some eight or nine years when Eddie Merckx was winning everything that they really did enjoy following the sport. And these four riders almost at the top now. The gap, if anything, has slightly widened behind. So we're looking now at the four riders who are going to fight out the finish of the 77th Liège Baston Liège. And Rolf Sorensen, the World Cup leader, is in a tremendous position now to go towards the Amstel Gold Race with a big lead in this competition. And after the Amstel Gold Race, you then go into the big tours, which of course aren't part of the World Cup. And then the World Cup is resumed with the Wincanton Classic in England. Killian continues to look over his shoulder. A sign of a man who now feels he's going to have to take on these riders in the sprint and let's hope he feels inspired. He's got all the reason to do well. The last time he'll come over the Cote des Forges in anger. Jordi Coquillion retiring at the end of this year after 13 years as a professional. He'll be missed in the big peloton, just like Sean Kelly will, his mate, when, uh, when he retires shortly. Over the top of the Côte des Forges, and look to me there, so Rolf Sorensen was feeling quite pleased about that. Now, what are the two Ariostia boys going to do? This is the second group here, Van Lanka still riding well, and Lacharetta. Now, and Stephen Roach. 14 kilometers, both fade for the chase, which is also on the top of the coat now. Well, Van Lanker must feel a little bit frustrated. He hasn't actually been able to have a shot at winning this race again. He was right in the lead group. He paid the price on the climb of the ladder dute. These riders just couldn't raise their effort to the sprinting powers that those other two went up at it. And didn't they go up it too, Argentine and Claudio Coquillion? But they recovered 
and then just couldn't quite find the extra energy needed to close down the gap. The final drink for Coquillion, the champion of Belgium, who's flown the flag today extremely well. There's nowhere left on this course now for Crick to attack. He's going to have to go down to the finish because Argentine will mark him for sure. And there must be some concern about Miguel Indurain. The riders in this breakaway will have been constantly trying to test one another. So I presume that each rider knows the strength of the other at this point in the race. The question is just what has Miguel Indurain got? He put two races down on his programme this year that he wanted to ride well in, Milan-San Remo and the liege Baston on liege He couldn't ride well in Milan-San Remo, he wasn't feeling at all well, but now He's come to, uh, to Liège, Baston Liège here, and he's put in a great ride. He's read all of the moves correctly. This breakaway forming, don't forget, a long time ago now, back on the Haute Levée. And of the original ten, we're down to just four. And somebody's gone from the group, and I think it's Raoul Alcala. Well, Raoul has sat at the back, he's not been doing much work, and now he's trying to cross the gap on his own. But it doesn't quite look as though he's firing too well, and in fact, it's Stephen Roach who's bringing him back. Now, if only Raoul had put some effort into the chase, you know, I have a feeling these four would have come back to the four out in front, because they were holding them for so long, but it's all too late now. Alcala is back in that chase group of four, we're heading on down towards the finish in the age, the sharp right turn at the bottom of this road, and then we're heading towards the quay and the finish line. Coquillion is going to have to sharpen his sprint now and take on these three. In Durain, he might well try and attack before the finish, Miguel, because I don't think he'll have any confidence at all in the sprint. I'm not too sure where he can attack now, because we've only got this flat run into the finish finish is actually about 200 meters from where we actually started this morning. We've gone completely around the Ardennes. And 23 seconds and two minutes, look, over two minutes now, back to Phil Anderson's group. The Roach group of 23 seconds. They won't be coming back today. The next time they'll see these three, when they look up to the finishing podium, it's only a question of which one will be standing on it. tell you that the whole of Belgium watching these television pictures are just standing on the edge of their seats here. They, they just want, they're willing for Killian now to win this race. But whichever way it goes, his last couple of races he's had in the Ardennes have been brilliant for him. He rode excellent, so well in the flesh well on. But he met a man there that was simply too good, Moreno Argentin. He broke away 70 kilometers in the finish. He fell off just round one of the corners on a, a very wet surface going downhill. And he must have only been leading at the time he fell by about 20 seconds. But he was up so quickly, they never even realized he'd fallen off. And he went away again, and of course he won. Now, Coquillion will be thinking of that, wondering just what he can do to beat Argentine at the finish today. Twice the Italian champion, by the way was the world champion back in 1986, as I said earlier. He rode the Tour de France last year, but after winning the stage, he also crashed out. And that ruined, really, his chance of the World Cup, which was won by his team, well, by his countrymen anyway, Gianni Bunyan. Everybody now is watching one another at the same time as trying to keep the pace respectable because they don't want that Roach group to come back. And certainly uh, Crick will remember now the last time he was involved in a chase in a leading group was with Stephen Roach in the A's Baston the A's and it was Argentine who came back because they started talking to each other about who was going to do the work to the finish. And as a result, of course, uh, Argentine came and went and won the race. And this race still being denied, Claude Coquillion. He 
finished second in 1986. 1984 or 5, he finished second. And he's also finished third. But he's never won it. The road shortly now will end in the countryside and will be into the outskirts of Liège. So we're almost at the finish, approaching now the 10 kilometer point. All 10 coats, little hills around the Ardennes are now behind the race for another year. And it's been a good race too. this it calls for a little bit of skill because you can get at the speeds of 90 kilometers an hour down this stretch of road it's a good wide very smooth surface descent you can turn the heavy gears and once you're off this hill you're going to be into the finish Still pedaling along at around 45, 50 kilometers an hour or more. Sonson looking very well. In fact, he's sort of saying to Kukilion, come on through, seven kilometers to go. Championship Sorensen back in 1987, the same year he finished second in his own national tour, the Tour of Denmark. But his best win as a new professional really was Tirano Adriatico, this race in Italy in the early part of the spring in March. And he's done that in 1987. He's turning out to be quite a rider for the classics because his first crack at the age bast on the age he finished eighth. And he was fourth in the Tour of Flanders. And he won the first big classic came his way when he won Paris Tours at the end of last season. A big sprint finish. Phil Anderson was involved in that sprint finish. But this year he's continued the form. Second Milan San Remo, third in the Tour of Flanders. Miguel Indurain sitting at the back here. He won his World Cup race last year too. The San Sebastian Classic, which is a very nice race in northern Spain big circuit and it was terrifically hot weather then and it was at that time too I seem to recall Indurain was away with Marino Lajaretta he got rid of Lajaretta and right now he's done the same again hasn't he because Lajaretta's in that chase group behind just five kilometers left to go now of the 264 out now that the elastic has snapped in that chase group we're not seeing too much of them ever since Raul Alcala put in that spurt to a break clear has gone back into the group it does look as though they've lost a little bit of their drive I know that Stephen Roach will be quite upset about that because he, at least he was true to his word when he said he would be in on the decision he was certainly there he could have done something on that ado to have been in the right position he could have been so often happens on a narrow road, you're trapped behind a rider who allows a gap to open, and when you try to go around that rider, you find it's too late. The gap has opened just a little bit too big. Sharp right-hand turn now. Now we're on the run-in towards the finish in Liège. Riders know it well. It's only been the last two years that we've come down to this finish here. The reason being, we used to finish right down in uh, the center of Liège, but it was not a good finish. In fact, it was rather a dangerous finish. And the riders are much happier with the organization over these last couple of years, which has brought the race a little bit out of the town. That doesn't stop the people coming out to watch the finish. It's on the opposite bank of the River Merza now. It's just down the road, becomes the River Mars, and goes into Holland and Maastricht, and that's the venue for next week's Amstel Gold Race.
finishes in Maastricht for the first time. breakaway becoming decisive without a Dutch rider in it but that's the way it is today and now the attacks are starting and surprisingly it's come from Moreno Argentine who hasn't left it till the sprint he's still about 1.2 kilometers from the line here and Argentine has gone and it is Krikilion immediately onto him well that's not surprising because Crick is marking Argentine everywhere he goes and it looks like it's been a dummy. And now the one-two for the Ariostia. That's to be expected. And look at this. Well, to me, Sorensen had it there. There was no reaction from Crick at all. And Sorensen just went and sat up as soon as Indurain had his wheel. And it's put now uh, the team leader of the Ariostia, who's loosening off his left leg there, at the back of the group. Now, they'll have to be careful here. If they start slowing down, then the chase group with Roach and Co. will be on them. It's still around 20 seconds, that gap. And it's still a fair way to go to the finish, too. Well, the one man I expected to attack didn't do so. Miguel Injuane, instead, it's been Argentine, followed by Sorensen. And Coquillion must feel as though the whole world is up against him right now. He doesn't know which way to look. Wants to know where Argentine is. It'll do well to keep an eye out behind them too, because the group behind is closing in. Briefly out of our sight. As they go under this underpass, and then they'll be back into our sight and lining up for the finish. Still no sign of the chase group there from our helicopter, and the four riders very much back together. Killion, the far right of the road now, almost toying with them, tempting them to come and get him. Then he starts to wind it up, and immediately Argentine follows him. Indurain looks for the wheel and finds it. Sorensen struggles a little bit and stays at the back. And Krakilion shrugs his shoulders. Uh, now that was Argentine, and now it is Sorensen. Tara Sorensen then goes down the right of the road now, and they've let him go. Sorensen has gone, it's left to Indurain to chase him now because of the rivalry between these two at the back. And Sorensen has gone now and could well be taking this. Indurain is about to catch him. So two riders and again he sat up. So again he sat up. It's almost as if he is riding this race for Argentine and doesn't want to go himself because Krakilion seems to be content to mark only Argentine. watching because they're coming believe me they're coming well as they approach the finish now this is still very much anybody's race but they're about 12 to 15 seconds behind no more than that and Coquillion is doing well to be concerned Argentine preparing for the final burst for the line. Indurain has been given the front now. Sorensen just tapping over there, keeping the pace at least a little respectable. They're underneath the one kilometer kite to go there. It's a long road, this. It's an excellent finish, but it really is a road that must be judged to perfection. And Argentine again has got the position he wants at the back, but he can keep an eye on every one of them. He's just ahead. It does seem as though Sorensen is almost willing Argentine to win this race. Twice he's attacked and twice, to me, he's had the break. But he's never pursued it. Heading up towards the finish now. And you see the official car has gone through and he wants to pull out everybody behind. There they are, kicking them all out because the group now is almost on their back wheel. It's about 10 seconds, the gap between these four and the Roach group. So the chase after all these kilometers is now coming down to almost eight men. The last little climb in Liège, Baston Liège. Van Lanka was alone when he came up that climb one year ago. Now he's in the group behind because once they flick onto the road here, they'll see the finishing line, Sorensen in the lead. And it's Sorensen who's going to lead out now. Crick is going in the centre. And Argentine to our left is now giving everything he's got here. Indurain is out of it. But it looks like Argentine is going to take on Claudio Coquillion. This is an inspired sprint by Coquillion. But it's not good enough. 
Moreno, Argentina, and a salute there too from his teammate Rolf Sorensen, and a congratulatory pat on the back from Claudio Coquillion. The same one two that we had just a couple of days ago, and Moreno, Argentina, delighted. But what a superb ride by the champion of Belgium in his final Liège Baston Liège. You have to feel sorry for Claude Coquillion today. They're the two boys who did it just right. Stephen Roach is in now. The 10 seconds was the final gap for Stephen Roach and he came in in eighth place. <laughs> that was a terrifically hard chase just after that do, wasn't it? Yeah. And, uh, if you had some of the guys had maybe believe more in their chances, maybe we would have been able to get back. Yeah. But like, I don't think the lads really believe we could, we could get back. Are we seeing the stars of the form of 87? I think it's... Uh, I think I can finish eight today, I think. In 81, my first year pro finished eight as well. <laughs> maybe I have another ten years to go, yes. The second, second generation of Stephen Roach. Well done. Second, second star. Stephen Roach, uh, what a nice man he is. And there's Moreno Argentine, who has become one of the champions of the Ardennes over the years now. This is his fourth Liège, Baston Liège. And Stephen Roach, well, he'll be back again later this season, I would suspect. And Argentine now joining Eddie Merckx and Stan Ockers and Ferdi Kubler as the man to do the double. Back in the hotel, Pedro Delgado, all ready to go back to Spain and uh, happy with the form. Phil Anderson, who is chasing just around uh, a minute for most of the race. You know, he shouldn't have the leg today, you know. You know, it's pretty that. Yeah, maybe if I had some other guys there, you know, might have been able to do a little better. You know, I had to do a bit of work myself. But... So this has been a great Liège Baston Liège, and it has found an exceptional winner in Moreno Argentine, who finishes just ahead of Claude Coquillion and Bolt Sorensen. Disappointed now, but because we won the race, there's always a little, you always say, ah, maybe I could have won, you know, but the team won, that's very important, and a uh, fellow like Argentine, which is a guy who you can trust, and he will always give, give it uh, back to you in, uh, in another time. Now I'm leading the World Cup, and he's going to help me when the problem is going to come. Claude Coquillon can leave the Ardennes with his head held high. Two second places, both to the same man, and what a superman that Moreno Argentine turned out to be this year. Unbeatable was the word, and Claudio Coquillon will have to think about that for the career which ends at the end of this season. Here's the sprint again. Miguel Injuane already out of it and hitting the front of Moreno Argentine. Claudio Coquillon really did try, but he was still half a length to the worst. Salute two from Rolf Sorensen, who keeps his lead and increases his lead in the World Cup competition. So, confirmation of the result, Moreno Argentine, the 267 kilometers in seven hours, 15 minutes. Second, Claudio Coquillon. Third was Rolf Sorensen. Fourth, Miguel Injuane. Fifth, Eric Van Lanker. And sixth, Raul Alcala. So, from the Ardennes, and until the next time we meet, it's goodbye.